Welcome CyberMDs to another lecture and the first lecture in the undifferentiated patient lecture series. In this lecture series, the goal is to provide you with a framework for thinking about the differential diagnoses for various chief complaints and how to approach the workup that your patients might need. Before we get started, please remember to like, comment, and or subscribe if you find the content here useful in any way at all so that we can continue to provide free medical education resources for students around the world. Now, let's dive into the lecture. Overall, weakness is a pretty non-specific chief complaint that has a lot of or a very wide variety of life-threatening etiologies that are possible for that weakness. Because it's so nonspecific, it means there's going to be a wide differential diagnosis that you should be considering in these patients. And here, we're going to be using a mnemonic to make sure that we don't miss anything serious when we encounter these patients in our practice. So let's get started with learning the mnemonic, which is the chief complaint itself, weakness. So for our W, we're actually going to flip that upside down and use it as an M. The three things that we are considering as we start off with our differential under the M will be malignancy, medications or polypharmacy, and mood or major depressive disorder. Remember that as we move through a differential diagnosis, we should be using our history to rule in or rule out the possibility of specific diagnoses and tailor our physical exam and our workup to that differential diagnosis. So for these diagnoses, we may want to ask questions like, how long have you been weak for? If they say two days, I'm less suspicious for a malignancy, but if they say three months, it becomes higher on my differential. If they do say three months, I may follow it up with a question about fevers or chills or easy bruising. I may look for pallor on physical exam or see if the patient looks cachectic. And this is a bit of a cheat in terms of the mnemonic when it comes to malignancy, uh, but I may be ordering HIV and hepatitis testing as well if the weakness and fevers are more chronic in nature and more nonspecific. Uh, I may be thinking about uh, those diseases as well. With regards to polypharmacy, this is something that the patient will have to outright tell you about or that you will see in your chart review. Uh, if they are on drugs such as lithium that have a very narrow therapeutic window and are known to cause side effects when they rise above that window, you may want to tailor your questions towards known side effects of those medications. In the case of lithium, maybe you ask about GI upset or tremors, and you might be on the lookout for a tremor on your physical exam. For patients who take acetaminophen, maybe for their arthritis, you may want to consider getting a level on them to rule out an attempted overdose in, in the right clinical setting. And then finally, for mood, or major depressive disorder, you should consider asking your patients the Siggy Caps questions and asking about hallucinations or suicidal and homicidal ideations to screen for any psychiatric conditions that may be contributing to the patient's weakness. Again, all of this in the right clinical setting. On physical exam, you can pay attention to their what you call duration of utterance, which is how long they talk to you without stopping, and you can pay attention to their overall affect whenever you're assessing for psychiatric or mood disorders. Next up is E, which is actually fairly straightforward. On every single patient who comes in with a chief complaint of weakness, you will be asking them questions about endocrine etiologies, specifically their thyroid. You should ask the appropriate historical questions for thyroid dysfunction to all of these patients. Um, you should be asking them questions that ask about you know, heat or cold intolerance. Those are kind of classic thyroid questions. You can ask about tremors as well. There are certain physical exam findings that are classically associated with thyroid dysfunction, such as the coarse hair and brittle nails for hypothyroidism, as well as the smooth, silky, fine hair and tachycardia for hyperthyroidism. With that being said, you can also look for more concerning signs, such as the exophthalmos and pretibial edema, which could potentially tip you off that maybe the patient could go into myxedema coma soon. Things that are more concerning, you should be looking for those as well, making sure there's not an emergency at hand. Uh, for these patients, you're most likely going to want to order a TSH level on all of them. And in some settings, especially like the outpatient setting, you will likely want to order a T4 level as well. 
In the emergency department, it can be difficult to rationalize ordering a T4 level because the patient will likely be admitted to an inpatient service or discharged from the hospital before that ever comes back, so it won't be a part of your clinical decision making if you're an emergency medicine physician. Next up is the letter A, which is going to encompass anemia, arrhythmia, and acute coronary syndrome. These are three diagnoses that you definitely can't miss in patients who come in with a chief complaint of weakness. Anemia, you can consider common routes of blood loss, such as GI bleeds, and therefore you would want to consider asking your patients about blood in their stool or whether it's been bright red or whether they've seen black in their stool recently. You can also always ask your patients as to whether or not they've experienced any episodes of vomiting blood or coughing up blood within the last few days since their weakness started. As far as any arrhythmia and acute coronary syndromes go, you may want to consider asking your patients about a personal history of heart disease as well as family history of heart disease. And you should ask them about associated risk factors for heart disease, such as hypertension, diabetes, smoking, alcohol use, illicit drug use, especially cocaine. On physical exam, for all of these patients to rule out the anemia, the arrhythmia, the acute coronary syndrome, you can look for things like conjunctival pallor or other signs of anemia. You can listen to their heart sounds as well, uh, and you can palpate their pulse to make sure that the rhythm is regular, that they don't have atrial fibrillation, that they don't have any new onset of any kind of murmurs that are you know, a loud blowing holosystolic murmur that, it, that is new, that has not been charted previously, and that they've never been told about, those would be things that would be very concerning on physical exam with regards to this portion of the differential diagnosis. In order to ensure that you're not missing any of these, you, you will almost certainly order a CBC with a differential and an EKG on every patient who has a chief complaint of weakness, unless there's a very clear cut etiology otherwise. Uh, you'll also potentially want to trend their hemoglobin over time if it's the inpatient setting uh, to make sure that their labels are stable before you discharge them, especially if they end up having to receive blood products for their anemia as the source of their weakness. The next letter is K, and we're going to cheat a little bit here in our mnemonic as well. We're just going to use the sound that the letter K makes, and we're going to do the three things that you can't live without can't live without food, you can't live without water, and you can't live without oxygen. So if you can't eat, you may be hypoglycemic, or you may be malnourished. If you can't drink, you may be dehydrated. And if you can't breathe, you may be hypoxic, or maybe you have some sort of respiratory distress or respiratory failure. You should consider all these diagnoses, especially hypoglycemia, in the vast majority of the patients you see who complain of weakness. You can ask them about their PO habits and when the last time they had anything to eat or drink was. You can ask them about conditions such as diabetes that may predispose them to blood glucose abnormalities. Uh, this could potentially lead you down the rabbit hole of dysphagia and airway obstruction as well, but we won't go down that route during this lecture. You should ask about conditions such as COPD and asthma if you have respiratory concerns, as well as questions regarding viral and bacterial airway infections. With regards to a physical exam in these patients, you can look for skin tinting and dryness of the oral mucosa. You can also assess the patient for signs of cyanosis and increased work of breathing. If you have ultrasound readily available to you in your clinical setting, you can use the ultrasound to look at the patient's inferior vena cava and assess the collapsibility of the IVC as an indicator of their fluid status. Finally, if a patient can't breathe, uh, i.e. they're hypoxic or they're in some sort of respiratory distress or respiratory failure, and this is very obvious to you, um, you can continue to ask them about like the onset of their shortness of breath you should definitely make sure that you put them on the monitor and get an O2 saturation level on all of these patients with a chief complaint of weakness. As far as the actual testing goes, again, you can get a blood sugar to make sure they're not hypoglycemic. Uh, you don't wanna miss hypoglycemia on your patients. If the clinical setting is correct, you can think about ordering lab values such as a folate level or a B12 level, especially if this is an outpatient cons uh, outpatient setting and you are really thinking about malnourishment in your patient, uh, 
You can even consider ordering a VBG or an ABG if it's more urgent and this is in the emergency department. Uh, and make sure your patient's not dehydrated, that they're ventilating, they're oxygenating, doing all of these things appropriately as their weakness could be due to chronic conditions such as COPD. And with regards to that ventilation, you can also ask them about history of asthma, make sure they're not having an anaphylactic reaction and that they don't need intubation or some kind of emergent care super soon. Okay, next up is the letter N, which is going to cover our neurologic and neuromuscular issues. With regards to the neurologic issues, this specifically refers to the most scary things such as stroke and seizures. I cannot stress this enough. This will be the first thing you want to rule out in a patient who comes in with a chief complaint of weakness. Is this patient having a stroke? You should immediately ask about when the onset of the weakness was and whether it was sudden or not and what kind of other symptoms they were experiencing that made them come in to the emergency department or the outpatient clinic, especially if it was sudden and onset. You have to rule out a stroke. Time is brain. You should do a neurologic exam immediately to make sure that you have all of the patient's cranial nerves intact, and that they don't have any focal neurologic deficits. If there is any concern at all, or if the patient has an unreliable history, you should probably proceed with a CT scan of the brain without contrast to rule out any kind of hemorrhagic stroke. To make sure that the patient hasn't had a seizure, you should ask about any history of jerky movements, any unresponsiveness, which was followed by a state of confusion, which we call the post-ictal state. And you can ask about a history of seizures, and if they have a history, when was their last seizure, and if they've been sick or taking their medications as prescribed. You can ask about anything else in their history that would make you suspicious for a reduction in the patient's seizure threshold. If you suspect a seizure, make sure you look for signs of tongue biting or urination on physical exam. These are all things that clue you in that this patient had a seizure. And then with regards to neuromuscular disorders, these are going to be things such as demyelinating disorders and disorders of the neuromuscular junction. Diagnoses such as multiple sclerosis, myasthenia gravis, Guillain-Barre, botulism, all of those kinds of things. Make sure you ask appropriate historical questions if you suspect any of these diagnoses, such as does the weakness improve with repeated movement or does it get worse with repeated movement? You may want to ask questions such as, have you had any recent diarrhea or any recent GI upset? I can't stress this enough. For these patients in this part of your differential diagnosis, the most important thing is to rule out the neurologic emergency that is a stroke. Time is brain. If you suspect a stroke, the patient should receive that non-contrast CT scan of their brain as soon as possible because time is brain. Next in our mnemonic is the letter E, which stands for electrolytes. It can be difficult to assess whether or not you think a patient may have electrolyte imbalances simply by taking a history unless the patient has a strong and current history of drug or alcohol use and they actively tell you about malnutrition or recent bouts of vomiting or pro a prolonged decrease in their eating and drinking habits. However, even then, some patients may come in with a chief complaint of weakness for which you do not suspect any electrolyte abnormalities, but upon further workup, you discover that the patient is severely hyponatremic. For almost all of your weakness patients, make sure you order labs that will give you information about their sodium, their potassium, their calcium, their magnesium, their phosphorus. Make sure you cover those bases. These are issues that are relatively easy to fix if we catch them early, but they can have devastating, life-threatening, life-ending effects if we leave those things untreated. In addition to this, that EKG that we discussed obtaining earlier may have long QT intervals if the patient has low levels of some of these electrolytes, or they may have peak T waves in the event that they have hyperkalemia. If they have hypokalemia, you may see the classic prominent U waves on the EKG. In addition to those things, hypercalcemia can also manifest with ST segment, T wave, and U wave alterations. So if you see EKG changes, you can also be suspect for electrolyte imbalances. The first S in our mnemonic stands for syncope, 
for syncope, you should ask your patients if they have experienced any lightheadedness or any loss of consciousness. They may describe complete syncope, which is that complete loss of consciousness, consciousness with a rapid return uh, of their consciousness with no confusion after, no postictal state. You can ask them if they hit their head or if they're on any blood thinners, as you might be suspicious for some kind of intracranial bleeding secondary to the trauma from the fall after they syncopized. Remember that there's no postictal state, as I just stated, and therefore they shouldn't be confused after these episodes occur. Sometimes you'll have to differentiate between syncope and seizure. The loss of consciousness, again, is super brief, usually only a few seconds long. Make sure that if you suspect this as the etiology of their weakness that you ask about all of the events leading up to the syncopal or presyncopal event where they just got lightheaded and they almost pass out. This can help you create a better framework for understanding what the etiology of the syncope is. For instance, if they describe straining or lifting something really heavy right before they syncopize, then you should be extremely suspicious for vasovagal as the etiology of their syncope. Whereas if they describe multiple syncopal or presyncopal episodes whenever they're changing positions from sitting to lying flat or vice versa, then you're going to be thinking about orthostatic etiologies. You should also consider mechanical obstruction in the heart, like hokum, uh, arrhythmias, strokes, PEs, and again, electrolyte derangements as other possible etiologies of syncope if syncope is the source of their weakness and make sure that you work those possible diagnoses up appropriately, given the right clinical context as your suspicion arises for each of those diagnoses. You should consider ordering an ultrasound to rule out that mechanical obstruction, or you can use POCUS if you're in an emergency department, and if you're suspicious enough for pulmonary embolism, you can order a CT angiogram. Again, for stroke, make sure you order that CT non-contrast of the brain if you're suspicious at all, and an EKG to rule out any kind of arrhythmia. One more thing about syncope, make sure you also differentiate it not just from seizure, but from dizziness. Oftentimes, these patients will present to the ED complaining of syncope, and they may come to the outpatient uh, clinic complaining of, oh, I'm passing out, but they really have dizziness. And it can also work the other way around where they say they're dizzy, but they're really passing out and syncopizing. Ask questions about the room spinning versus lightheadedness and loss of consciousness, and then proceed with your history, physical, and workup appropriately. The last S in our mnemonic stands for sepsis. Oftentimes, you can spot a septic patient from a mile away because they have a super high fever and they look super sick as you examine them. They may even have altered mental status. If they can provide a history, you should ask them questions about how long they've had the fever for, how high it was gotten, if they were able to measure it at home, and if they have had any other symptoms that may lead you to a specific source. These are questions that can include, you know, have you had a cough or any shortness of breath? You could also ask about problems urinating, such as pain with urination or blood in the urine. On these patients, you should make sure that you auscultate their lungs, both anterior anteriorly and posteriorly for any signs of a pneumonia and check for CVA tenderness in the event that they might have pyelonephritis or some kind of urinary tract infection. If you suspect sepsis as an etiology for the patient's weakness, you're likely going to be ordering a urinalysis with culture, um, getting a chest x-ray and getting blood cultures as you're trying to identify a source of the patient's infection. Sepsis is all about source control, but you have to find the source first. Make sure that you do a thorough exam from head to toe so that you don't miss any ulcers or any other lesions on the patient's skin that could be another source of infection as well. Thanks so much for tuning into this lecture. If you find our videos useful at all, please be sure to let a friend know, like, comment, subscribe, so that we can continue to provide free medical education resources to students all around the world. Uh, make sure that you remember that you can catch all of our lectures for free on Spotify as well, and we'll see you next time.